Just two weeks ago, on February 12th, a suit was filed in U.S. District Court for the District of Connecticut on behalf of Selena Sole, a minor by Bianca, her mother, Chelsea Mitchell, a minor by Christina Mitchell, her mother, Alana Smith, a minor by Cheryl Redkowski, her mother, against the Connecticut Association of Schools and others. And I'm giving you an idea that I'm just reading right off for the top of the filing. Representing these three young girls in court and seeking to defend the right of people to live freely, their faith is Alliance Defending Freedom, which is an alliance building, nonprofit legal organization that advocates for the right of people to freely live out their faith. And I want to right now welcome in a senior counsel for Alliance for Defending Freedom, Denise Harley. Denise, thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me on, Sam. Glad to be here. Denise, oh, we always have a short time here, but I want to start here quickly. The major problem here that we've been talking about just briefly before you got on us is that there seems to be a crossing of natural lines throughout our culture. Plainly, there is one in this case, a problem with boys being allowed to compete in girls' sports. And there's something naturally wrong with this scenario. But in this lawsuit, explain the legal problem that you've identified and the injunctive relief on behalf of these three girls, and I would say on behalf of other girls like them all across the country. What's this about? Well, girls deserve to compete on a level playing field, and forcing female athletes to compete against biological males ignores real differences between the sexes, and it's, it's not fair. Title IX was designed to eliminate discrimination against women in education and, and in sports, and designed specifically to provide equal opportunities for girls. So Connecticut's policy flies in the face of 50 years of law under Title IX that ensures that women have equal opportunity. So that's our main argument in the lawsuit, that this is a plain violation of Title IX. I appreciate you being with us today, Denise, and we are very, very thankful for ADF and all that it does across the nation to stand for our freedoms. We need groups like you. But in this particular case that we're talking about, obviously we recognize that it is a legal matter. But do you view it also as a religious liberty matter or a moral matter and so forth? And if so, how can all of those be separated? Well, when we start to ignore the biological differences between males and females, it very quickly becomes a religious liberty matter. And let me give you two quick examples from some of the other cases that we here at Alliance Defending Freedom are um, working on right now. One of those is on behalf of a homeless women's shelter in Anchorage, Alaska called Downtown Hope Center. Uh, that center has been prosecuted by the city of Anchorage for refusing to allow a man who identifies as a woman to come in and sleep in this overnight shelter that's specifically designed for women, many of whom have been raped, uh, sex trafficked, or otherwise abused at the hands of men. And Downtown Hope Center is based on uh, a message of the truth of the Bible, which is in includes God's creation of male and female, and they believe that the Lord has called them to a mission to serve women. So f to be forced to pretend that men are women absolutely tramples on their religious freedom. The other big case is one that we at ADF argued in the Supreme Court in October. We're still awaiting a decision on that, and that involved our faith-based family-owned business, Harris Funeral Homes, in Michigan that um, was prosecuted again by the government for refusing to allow a male employee to, after six or seven years, begin uh, dressing and presenting as a woman. It was something that our client felt was uh, very disruptive uh, and did not fit with his business. And so it certainly was a conscience burden and a religious freedom burden for him to ignore the bio biological realities. Denise, in regard to the way this case has been filed, it would appear that on its face it is a direct violation of Title IX, which means I'm amazed that it even has gone forward. What has the court done so far? Have they given any kind of injunctive relief? Where's this sit right now? We haven't gotten any response from the court yet. In fact, it was just filed, I think, as you noted, two weeks ago. So, But we are seeking immediate emergency relief. And 
one reason we had to go this route is that we filed an administrative complaint with the federal government, which we did that back in the spring, and it was based on Title IX, and the government has said it has begun an investigation into this process. But what we've seen is these young women have now suffered through almost another school year and track season where they're being robbed of opportunities to excel and compete. And so we, we saw it was necessary to go the next step and ask a federal court for immediate emergency relief to set this policy straight and bring it back in line with what Title IX guarantees to all young women. Hmm. Well, again, like I said, we appreciate very much for what you are doing out there. And this topic that we're dealing with today is a topic that maybe some of our people are familiar with and some maybe aren't familiar with it at all. So let me ask you, as you are there at ADF working with various situations from time to time, how many cases like this does ADF have? And do you find that it is growing more and more as our country is seemingly becoming more secular and falling away from biblical truth? We are finding this to be one of the main issues that we're busy um, standing for on behalf of our clients. Yeah, we probably have somewhere close to a dozen cases now involving the issue of transgender identity and um, whether um, there's a difference between male and females. One of those um, involves high school locker and shower rooms where our client, a young female teenager, felt very uncomfortable with males being in the bathrooms and the shower facilities. Uh, others of our cases are on behalf of professors who are Christians and are being forced by their university to use um, the pronoun that does not match the biological reality of the student. And so rather than being able to call the student by their name, the university is forcing um, professors to say he when it's she and so forth. And so we're seeing this spread even into adoption agencies we're defending um, that want to place children in homes that, with one man married to one woman and are being uh, prosecuted and with threatened of being shut down by their state governments. So we are seeing this as a very real problem, and we would love your listeners to go to our website anytime, adflegal.org, and you can read short summaries of these cases where we boil down what the main issues are, and you can follow along with the breaking news and um, pray alongside with us. And Denise, I'm glad that Gary asked you that question, because I was going to go that way with you too, to say, where else are we seeing this, as I'm terming it, crossing that natural line. If boys are no longer boys, but maybe girls, I mean, wow, that just seems to me, Denise, we don't have time to go into it, but if ADF is not successful in winning cases like this, to me, it's almost like bar the windows and the doors because laws could change all across and so many other sectors. This is a big deal in a lot of ways. This is a very big deal. And, it, and that's, in fact, that's the goal of um, proponents of this are this ideology really want that kind of sweeping change and it could it could rob women of of protections that we have under all sorts of laws including you know maternity policies opportunities for women owned businesses um, protections against women having to serve in the military um, it it goes beyond sports and in bathrooms to things much greater than that. And I don't even think we can probably foresee all of the consequences of denying what the Lord tells us in Genesis about God creating us male and female. So in the end of the day, we're about done about in a minute here. So really, what is at stake? If I could net it all down, you have these legal protections, Title IX, as an example, that's a specific legal protection that's there. But in the end of the day, what's under challenge right now is God's view of male and female. In other words, the entire approach of gender, male, female, marriage, husband, wife, father, mother, children, that whole basic construct is what really you're defending at this point, is it not? It is. But the good news is that all we need the court to see is that the laws we're basing our lawsuits on right now very plainly say sex, meaning male and female. And so we don't need the courts to necessarily buy into what 
you know, the the three of us and all your listeners believe, Mm -hmm. um, because thankfully we can stand firm just on the law. And so that's what we're hoping for and praying for is that these very solid arguments, common sense arguments about biology and science will be accepted. Well, we hope so. And that's what we talk about on the program, Denise, biblical worldview. If one does not have a biblical worldview, common sense seems to fly out the window. Thank you for what you're doing. Thanks for being on with us today and informing our listeners about this most important topic. 